What is it that you want most out of life? Yeah, it's a huge question, and it's maybe one that you might not want to ponder, but I do mean it this morning. What is it that you want most out of your life? We're pondering that question this morning because of our Bible readings, but we're also pondering it because of where we find ourselves in the life of the church year. I just told it to our young ones, this is almost the last Sunday of Pentecost. Next Sunday really is the last Sunday, but this uh, next Sunday is the reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday. So this is the last day that we'll get to say Pentecost. But that's the Sunday that always ends the church year before we start the new season or the new year in the life of the church that we begin in Advent. So leading up to the Advent season this year, we get readings in the Bible that talk about the coming day of the Lord. We heard about it last week. We hear about it again this morning. The day of the Lord is the day in which Jesus comes back and we stand before him ready to give an accounting of the hope that is in us. So as we anticipate and we prepare for that day, what is it that you want most out of your life? What is it? that you will say to Jesus when he comes back. Now, I can't pretend to answer that question for you. Only you can do that for yourself. But I will share with you what I want most out of life. I want to be loved and I want to love others. I want the world to be a place where all people are accepted, where we are respected and where we respect each other enough to be in relationships with other people even people with whom we disagree and whom we're not really sure get it. I want to know that I've done the best I can in life. I want to use the gifts that God has given me, not for personal gain in some sense, but for the good of my brothers and sisters, my neighbors, and my community. And as I stand before Jesus, the one thing that I want more than anything else, I want to hear the words that the master says of his two slaves in our gospel reading from Matthew. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been faithful and trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. Well done. Those are two things I long to hear. I long to hear them from God and from Jesus and to feel them by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to hear them from my parents and my wife and my daughter and in a very real and honest way, I want to hear them from you, my beloved brothers and sisters whom I love in the joy of the Lord and who I really hope are in this thing that we call faith together. I can only bet that you all would want to hear similar words. Maybe your list of people would be different of whom you want to hear those words from, but in the end of all things, I have a hunch that all humanity wants to hear those words. And as that's true, I can understand this parable of the talents that Jesus tells from Matthew on that level. I can really get the joy of the master whose first two servants uh, who were given all of this money, these five and these two talents, and they've doubled those talents for the sake of their master. Scholars are always quick to point out about this reading the absurd nature of these talents. One talent is equal to about 15 years worth of wages. So to all of these slaves, not just the two, to all three, the master leaves and entrusts a huge amount of money, property, and responsibility. It's a great honor to be entrusted with those things and especially that much. And they do well with what they've been given. Well done, good and trustworthy slaves. Yet on the other hand, I can also understand this parable from the point of the third slave. In fact, that has been where I have settled and I find myself relating to this week. The third slave is given one talent, an amount that pales in comparison to his other colleagues, but something holds him back from doing what the others did. He doesn't trade with other people. He doesn't invest his money with the bankers. And the responsibility of receiving these 15 years worth of wages and wanting to be acceptable and return something to his master, he hides it in the ground. Now we don't know whether or not his claim is uh, that his master is a harsh man is 
substantiated or not, none of the other two slaves validate that. But in a very real way, I can relate to this guy's fear. While I haven't been entrusted with lots and lots and lots of money, I have been entrusted with gifts and abilities that my master or God has given to me and called me to use in the world. And the truth is that sometimes I'm afraid of using them. I'm afraid of coming off in some holier-than-thou attitude in relationship to other people. I'm afraid that if I live into my love of other people, and I mean all kinds of people, then I'm going to make someone mad. I'm afraid that what I think and believe isn't going to be popular in the circles that I travel, and so maybe it just needs to stay inside of me. And so sometimes I give in to my fear and I bury those talents. I bury my abilities and my love and my compassion, my heart for the underdog, and my passion that everyone in the world would know that they are loved and that they matter by a God who really is loving and kind and not some judging, arrogant jerk face. Sometimes I'd rather not even claim those things out loud or invest myself in them for the sake of offending others. And so I bury them. I bury what I have so that I can give it back to God exactly as it was given to me in the first place. But you see, there's the problem. There's the problem with the third servant or slave in this parable. This is not a parable about staying the course. This is not about a parable about emphasizing the if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. God is not looking for us to maintain the status quo before God in the flesh where Jesus comes back. We've been given these abilities and these talents and these passions so that we can invest them in our lives and in our world for the sake of the abundant life of our neighbors. See, this is about being faithful with what we've been given. So then how can we be faithful if we're stuck in neutral, or worse, stuck in fear? See, this is a parable about risk-taking. We are given these abilities, these passions, these talents, so that we will risk using them to make the world a better place and to show by our words and our actions that we are disciples and followers of Jesus who shows us what the kingdom of God is like and encourages us to live that way in the world. We're meant to stretch ourselves. We're meant to experiment. We're meant to grow the kingdom of God. And if we take Jesus' parable seriously, then this is not a time to play it safe. This is a time to risk giving ourselves away for the sake of our neighbors and the world. It's a time to live like we have absolutely nothing at all to lose, because we don't. I've shared before that one of my professors in seminary said the most freeing phrase of my career on the first day that I had this person in class. He said, you have absolutely everything that you need. God has given you everything that you need. Now the challenge is to trust that. The challenge is to find the abundance that God gives and not to live into the fear that the world would impose on us by trying to say that we're less than or that we're lacking in some way. Sisters and brothers, we have absolutely nothing to lose. And so I'm trying, maybe albeit imperfectly, to step outside of my fear zone today and claim that. If I have nothing to lose and God has given me all that I need, then this morning I want to propose a way that we can invest our talents and our passions and our abilities in the world together as the people of Peace Evangelical Lutheran Church. If you come to the annual meeting in just a few moments, you'll hear a little bit more about this. But as we move forward to invest ourselves in the world, then my hope and my vision is this. My vision is that we would be a congregation that builds authentic, vulnerable community through radical hospitality, discipleship, love, and service. Briefly, that means we will be authentic. We would tell the truth. We would live into our brokenness and not the proverbial little perfect people that we think we should be. 
We would be a vulnerable community that's willing to admit that we aren't perfect, that we have a bit to learn, and that we can really share life with others through joys, through sorrows, through disappointments, through grief, and everything else. As we create that authentic, that vulnerable community, we do it through radical hospitality. Jesus welcomed all people into his life and ministry, people whom the world said didn't matter, people who were different, people who were flawed. So should we. And we can only do that through discipleship, through love and service. We can only be Jesus people when we value what Jesus values, and we can only discover that as we look and we, as we love and as we serve others and we work on ourselves spiritually through a life of prayer, humility, and love. Those are the things that I believe we are called to use and invest in in our world as a community of faith. You may disagree with me, and that is perfectly fine, but this is the way that I know how to be authentic as the leader and the person that God has called me to be and that you have called me to be as a leader of this congregation. This is our time, sisters and brothers. We have nothing at all to lose. In fact, even as we invest ourselves, and even if we lose, I have a hunch that we will still receive our master's note of joy. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. I, you have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. Amen.